Okay, and let me check if it's streaming on, on YouTube as well. Yes, we're enabling live transcript. Brilliant. I hope it is working on, yes, it is working on YouTube too. Brilliant. So, um, Caitlin, would you be ready? Yeah? Yep. Cool. yeah, perfect. So welcome everyone, uh, great pleasure uh, to welcome Caitlin to UCL, both physically and digitally for everyone who is here. Um, Caitlin is a wonderful person who is a feminist activist, a researcher and an academic based in Melbourne. She just finished her PhD and submitted uh, in digital ethnography uh, uh, in the Digital Ethnography Research Center at RMIT University. Uh, and her thesis is actually, I think partially, I mean, I don't know if this is a chapter or, or the whole thing uh, on, on how um, the thesis investigates how women are actually feel about their smartphones and especially about the tracking aspects of them. Which of course, uh, for those of you who know the work that we're doing uh, in the team is quite interesting um, because we're very passionate about that problem of like tracking and using tech for these purposes as well. And uh, Caitlin, uh, uh, you know, uh, works a lot on online safety of women. She's practicing this also, not just from a researcher perspective, but also provides like training and consultancy um, and uh, has just been in the area for a conference in Dublin, actually called Association of Internet Researchers. So it was just a small like we, I want to say train ride, but it was more of an easy chat or Ryanair flight probably uh, to London to uh, come over to us. So uh, with that, uh, I want to hand over to Caitlin. Uh, a big thank, uh, thank you at this stage for uh, the person that helped with the tech, especially Demelsa. And uh, we will, uh, Caitlin, just if we can speak like for 30, 40 minutes, and then we have Q&A with the rest of the people in the room. So uh, I will monitor in the chat if there's any questions for Caitlin as we go along. And uh, if there's any tech issues, just reach out. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you so much, Leonie. And, um... Thanks everybody for being here. So I've got, I've got like three different things happening. So I might, my eyes might be looking absolutely all over the place, but you'll have to, so you have to forgive me for sort of not looking like I'm, I don't know, looking sort of cross-eyed or something. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much to Leonie for inviting me to speak and to Demelza for hosting me today. So my name is Caitlin McGrain and I'm, I'm in that limbo space between submitting my PhD and getting my examiner's report. So it feels very weird to still describe myself as a PhD candidate, but also that's exactly what I am in the Digital Ethnography Research Center at RMIT. And today I'll be presenting on the research that I submitted in, or I wrote about in my PhD thesis that's focused on women's thoughts, feelings, and perceptions about their smartphones and through the lens of like thinking about surveillance and risk. So, let me just navigate over to here. And I would like to begin this presentation today by acknowledging the uh, that my research took place on the lands of the Jaitmatang, Kurnai, Waveru, Woiwurrung and Wurundjeri peoples. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, First Nations and Indigenous peoples here today. I acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded across the countries and waterways that make up what we now call Australia, and the lands and waters always were and always will be Aboriginal land. So I wrote my PhD thesis on the affordances of smartphones in women's everyday lives. Through a feminist and intersectional lens, I analysed how women felt about their smartphones, paying particular attention to the everyday ways that, smart, that their smartphone use implicated them in systems of surveillance and control and analyzing how they felt about this. My field work was conducted in November, 2019, shortly before a summer of truly ferocious and horrific bushfires in Australia and the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this means that my data is from a particular point in time and the world that we now live in is in some ways quite different. I don't wanna imply that this somehow like invalidates my data, but I do think that the context is really important. The other major thing that has occurred in Australia in the intervening years since I collected my data is that a range of, oh, sorry, Sarah, can you not see the slides? If you could check for me, Demelza, that'd be amazing. Ah, you Just can't see. Just moment. 
Okay. Okay. Sorry. Bear, bear with me a second. I'm like. There we go. Share screen options. I'm going to go. share go. desktop too. Yeah. How's that going? Yay! Okay, we're done. We're done. Okay, fantastic. All right. So um, this is just the acknowledgement of country was just what you what you might have missed before, but um, I read that out, so I think that's okay. So uh, where am I? Um, so the in the intervening years, there have been a range of companies. So like data breaches, as I think most of you would already know, they happen all the time. They happen sort of fairly regularly. They're fairly common. Um, with different sort of levels of, uh, with different effects, right? And what's happened in Australia in the last, I don't know, maybe four weeks, it's been really, really recent, five, four to five weeks, is that there have been a series of really catastrophic data breaches of, of customer data. So some of these are the result of company incompetence, like in the Optus data breach, where the API was just left open to the public, and others are the result of sophisticated attacks on company systems. Um, so the Optus hack, uh, which affected millions of Australians, um, occurred about a week before I submitted my thesis, which is really good timing. Um, but since then, there's also been one uh, affecting Medibank, which covers actually all of the insurance for all um, international students in Australia. So the, so the effects are actually really quite, um, really quite serious. So what I want to do today is explore the connection between corporate and governmental data collection, surveillance and privacy in women's everyday lives through four case studies from my PhD. So these areas are kind of, they're things I gestured towards in my thesis, but didn't explore in too much detail, mostly because I just didn't have like the space to kind of really get into it. So in the context of, the, of these data breaches, I think it's worth considering how concerned we should be about the collection of our data, how we might resist these practices, how we might increase public awareness and how we might hold governments and corporations accountable. Um, so I'm gonna flag right away that I don't have the answers to any of these questions. Uh, and I've deliberately left quite a lot of time at the end because I think that you guys are the experts and you're probably gonna have a lot of suggestions. Um, is that working? Yeah. Hey, there we go, okay. So I'm going to navigate back to my thing. All right. Sorry, everyone. Just I'm literally navigating like four different things. Okay. So while I'm talking about women's lives, I want to emphasize that I'm speaking outside of the context of women's experiences of gendered violence. While my research, I was in in my research, I was initially interested in how fear, risk, and the threat of gendered violence. Um, might influence women's smartphone use, I found in my interviews that most participants did not describe being overtly worried about men's violence towards them or the threat of men's violence towards them. So I therefore switched my focus to be more about their general relationships with their devices and how this was shaping and being shaped by gender and other aspects of their identity. So why smartphones? So smartphones, I think, are really interesting because they have been so thoroughly absorbed into our into our everyday lives. The intimacy of the smartphone, how they are clo held, held close to the body, we can use them to collect personal data and they often tacitly collect data about us, has made the smartphone immensely important for mobile media researchers. And these scholars have been fascinated by the possibilities and limitations of mobile media, including smartphones, as they alter and influence our everyday lives. So smartphones are artifacts that encompass all the features of mobile telephones from the early 2000s and before from the 90s, such as phone calls and SMS services, while also being connected to the internet and thus enabling the convergence of services, functions and features. So a smartphone is smart, not just because it's connected to the internet, but also because they, they include accelerometers, touch screens, GPS and other kinds of sensors. So these sensors are designed to locate the device quite precisely and mostly accurately in space and therefore enable the user to perform a range of functions using one device. The development of the smartphone has not been linear, nor have they developed without criticism from activists, including in disability rights. These critiques have often made the smartphones better and more accessible to more people. 
So that means that smartphones are now nearly ubiquitous in Australia with over 90% of Australians owning and using one. In theorizing what mobile media, which encompasses smartphones are and how we might define them, Goggin and Horst uh, proposed that mobile media facilitate the dissolution of distinctions in various aspects of everyday life. So they say whether as an artifact, a set of practices across material and immaterial forms of personalization or a researcher's tool, mobile media has been an active participant in the dismantling of many boundaries as public and private, work and leisure, here and there, online and offline, embodied and disembodied. As the authors note, however, this, this, the dismantling of these boundaries has occurred on alongside and in conjunction with, quote, social stratification, disparity of wealth and income, and entrenched dynamics of inequality. So mobile media are, like other technologies, informed by the social conditions in which they are developed and used. So this is why I think smartphones are really interesting for me in relation to data collection and surveillance, because these activities are shaped by social context and power relations. So... Surveillance, privacy, and smartphone data collection are, sorry, and data collection are deeply interconnected. And it has been well established that network connectivity through our smartphones and their sensors mean our devices can be nearly constantly gathering, analyzing, aggregating, and sharing our data. As David Lyons stated in 2007, quote, today's surveillance is a particularly ambiguous process in which digital technologies and personal data are fundamentally implicated and meet in software coding that classifies yet more groups in different ways. And as Australian scholars such as Kinnan Monfada et al. and Dee Zwart et al. have outlined, much of these criticisms, much of the criticisms of these systems have occurred in the USA and European context. The nature of surveillance and public acceptance of it is highly context dependent. So it's really important in Australia for scholars in Australia to think critically about data collection, how this data is incorporated into systems of surveillance, what it means for privacy, and how people are resisting or contending with these systems in their everyday lives. And there are many scholars currently doing this, including those that I've mentioned just before, those leading the Centre for Automated Decision Making in Society, and Jean Burgess, Kat Albury, Anthony McCosker, and Rowan Wilkin, whose book Everyday, Dig everyday Data Cultures contends with some of the ways Australians are navigating and resisting these systems in their everyday lives. And as those authors argue, quote, Every everyday life is where the politics of digital transformation are worked through in practice as people negotiate, wrangle, learn and struggle with or against data intensive technologies in the context of their own bodies, lives, communities and histories. So in Australia, uh, corporations are required to collect personal data about customers and keep it for seven years. So this can include things like driver's license information, passport details, and dates of birth. So this is partly what has led to those massive data breaches that I mentioned at the beginning. The law requires co corporations, um, the, law, sorry, the, the law requires companies to keep this data, meaning that there is already the potential for it to be compromised if they can't or won't protect it. So in Kinnan et al.'s paper, the authors argue that, quote, all technology can be outsmarted given enough time, resources or ingenuity, end quote. And there are a couple of issues I have with this statement. The first is that the level of personal effort outsmarting such systems can involve. And the second is that this seems to reduce the problems of surveillance down to individuals. Now, I agree that surveillance can and should be resisted by individuals through their personal practices, but there should also be opportunities for resistance at a systemic or structural level. And there have been some reforms in Australia concerning the collection and retention of personal data. In 2019, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission's Digital Platforms Inquiry um, was tabled and the inquiry sought to understand, quote, the impact of social media search and content aggregation platforms on competition in media and advertising service, market, service markets, and particularly on how they were influencing the supply of news and public interest journalism. So it had a really particular focus. It was much more focused on like the sort of corporate systems around the uses of these platforms, but it does still provide some, I think, really useful um, recommendations. Uh, the report is enormous. And I think that there are plans to keep working on it until like 2025. So um, 
I've read parts of it so that you don't have to. And for me, I think the recommendations from chapter seven, which is titled Digital Platforms and Consumers, are probably the most interesting. So this chapter states, quote, all consumers will be better off when they are sufficiently informed and have sufficient control over their user data so they can make informed choices that align with their privacy and data collection preferences, end quote. So the recommendations from this chapter in the report are principally concerned with tightening user-focused data collection, sharing and retention policies from social media and search engines. So the recommendations are still focused on individual consumers. I think it's really, I think there is merit in tying individual consumer data protections to the obligations of, of governments and corporations, because this forces large institutions to take care of that personal and consumer data that they're collecting all day, every day. Whether they should be even collecting this data in the first place, I think that's a larger question that is kind of beyond the scope of not only of this presentation, but also beyond my limits of the knowledge about the law, but I really welcome any discussion about this. And before I sort of continue in talking about my data um, specifically, I want to return to the Goggin and Hulth quote about the social, social stratification, disparity of wealth and income and entrenched dynamics of inequality that frame and coincide with this technological development. So this is particularly important when we're talking about the gender dynamics of status of smartphone data collection and surveillance. And there are many scholars, including Leonie, Molly Dragowitz, Bridget Harris, Nicola Henry, and Anastasia Powell and others who have done incredibly important work investigating how women's experiences of gendered violence in public and private spheres are augmented and amplified by digital technologies. For women experiencing violence, the smartphone can become terrifying sites of abuse and violence. And in the Australian context too, researchers know that many of those most vulnerable to invasive state surveillance include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people living with disabilities, migrants and refugees, and people who receive government welfare. Some of the women I interviewed identified as belonging to one or more of these groups. And there is much more, I think, collaborative work to be done in this area. And I hope to contribute to furthering a feminist and intersectional approach to these issues. So now that I've like just chucked information at you for a few minutes about the context of Australian data collection and surveillance, I want to just like briefly touch on my methods and then I'll discuss the four focus, the four case studies from my PhD research. So my uh, methods. So in my research, I drew on digital and feminist ethnographic methods and I, or method methodologies rather. I collected data from 12 women in total, but I only, I only ended up using four as case studies in my thesis. Um, so like I mentioned at the start, the interviews took place right before the pandemic and I decided not to do follow-up interviews mostly because I didn't really want to write a thesis about COVID. And secondly, um, I thought the ways that we used our phones had changed so much. Um, and doing interviews at the height of the pandemic, I was worried it might sort of muddy the waters about the data I had collected. It was a bit of a mess, but I'm not so sure about this reasoning now. And I would like to do additional and follow up interviews, perhaps in like maybe a different context, like in Europe or something to compare behaviors and attitudes now that we live in a world with COVID. So the methods I employed were um, first a visual diary. So participants kept a visual diary of places that they felt emotionally connected to. And I asked them to record about five to 10 images using their smartphone camera. And I'll show you a few of those in a minute and a list of apps. So the, so the, sorry, the second thing was a list of apps. Participant listed the apps on their smartphone in order from most to least important or most to least favorite, whatever made sense to them. So these lists were really interesting. So participants had like wonderfully different interpretations of what important meant, which strongly influenced how we discussed things like data collection when they sort of considered, and also their sort of individual characteristic personal characteristics as well so sort of people there was a woman I interviewed that I'll talk about who lives with a visual impairment and so the way the the important apps to her were things like um uh settings whereas for many other many of my other participants it would be things like email social media that sort of thing um which I think is it sort of really shows the like the dynamics that are that are being played out in these devices and finally, so we did an interview 
um, of about 60 to 90 minutes where participants and I discussed the visual diary and the list of apps. So some of my participants were seemingly completely unconcerned with the ways that their smartphone might be tacitly tracking them through their location and other data, while others were moderately or considerably concerned. And I'll talk through a little of this in each case study and include some quotes or comments that participants made in relation to these issues. And if you have any questions about methods, I know that most of the time in these presentations, people do whiz through it because it's like, they're boring, nobody cares. But like, if you want to ask me any questions, I'm happy to, happy to take those. Um, so I will start with Helen. So Helen is a white cisgender woman in her 40s who lives with a visual impairment. She works in disability rights and is particularly interested in the lived experiences of women living with disabilities. This photo that you can see on the screen here is from her visual diary and is taken in the backyard where she can kind of see her neighbor's house. Um, and as Helen said, quote, there's a really small backyard and that's the best view of the small backyard. I guess that's more private again. That's my little space, even though it's overlooked and it will probably be more overlooked by others. In this photo, we can see that I think that the dynamics of privacy and visibility are being really strongly invoked. Helen feels she cannot avoid some exposure or potential surveillance from her neighbours because of the location and configuration of her house. In this image, Helen has turned the camera towards the house of her neighbour, who she has indicated may be able to look into her backyard. And I think this gesture can represent some of Helen's privacy concerns related to using a smartphone. While she feels safe and at ease in her backyard, she feels she might also still be surveilled. When I specifically asked Helen about how she felt about her smartphone gathering her data and tracking her, she said, I think that comes under the category of what I was saying around, it feels okay for now, but that could easily change. So depending on what things I need to do in my life and what circumstances are around me, particularly what bigger power structures are around me, that would really change. So Helen's sentiments echoed what, what other participants um, who I'll come to in a moment also said. There seemed to be a fairly pervasive idea amongst participants that while they didn't feel under imminent threat, they knew that they might be a fair, that might be a fairly tenuous position or un, sort of untenable position. And it could all change quite quickly. Rather astutely, Helen also said, using your phone, I guess it's like, how would you know if someone was surveilling you? Helen's approach to thinking about her phone and its capacity to collect her data and contribute to surveillance was to be cautious and keep an eye on the bigger picture, including bigger power structures at play. I think it's also important to consider Helen's comments in context with her lived experience. As she put it, I think overall smartphones have been a massive revolution for vision impaired people, um, for blind and vision impaired people, sorry. So therefore, I think we always need to remain critical in how we might propose proposed changes to data collection and datafication processes and practices that may negatively impact or make life harder for marginalized communities. Um, my next participant that I'll talk about is Glenda. So Glenda is a white cisgender woman in her 60s who lives in rural Victoria, about four hours drive from Melbourne. Glenda is an outdoor educator, a passionate geocacher, and a and her visual diary was one of the most like spectacular that I um, collected in my in my research. This photo that you can see here is taken from some wetlands, and I think they're in the east of the state. Um, and I really love the way that the light contrasts the grass with the sky. I think it's really um, spectacular. Um, so Glenda's enthusiasm for living outdoors was really seriously infectious. And she had this like relentlessly positive attitude to life. And I think part of this was because she had experienced like one quite significant loss in her life. So her partner died very shortly after their daughter was born. And so she had developed this incredible resilience and a detachment from material things, or, you know, so she told me. When I asked her whether personal data was something that was a, con was a concern for her, she said, no, no, because I'm thinking I'm just such a little person. What is someone going to do with all my stuff? I don't know. I think I just have this blind faith, I think. Blind faith that, you know, security will basically, well, the security systems will not take that much from me. You know, and I get, you know, I get about the algorithms. If you like something when you, and then you start getting ads and rah, rah, rah. 
But to be honest, my life's pretty simple here. So really, I hadn't really cared about it enough to feel alert and alarmed. Yeah, I'm not alert and alarmed at all. So as with other participants, Glenda had to weigh up the pros and cons, the benefits and risks of using her smartphone. As she said, you know, if I want to use Google or anything else, then I've handed over all that. You know, you read about surveillance and the world that we live in. So that's just too big a thing for me to even be able to do anything about other than not being engaged at all. The benefits outweigh that remote little chance that, you know, you know, I can ring my mum up any time or if I need to or all sorts of things. And then when I'm running camps, you know, the parents can ring me. There's oodles and oodles of reasons to have this thing now. So I think what Glenda is tapping into here is this uh, feeling that I think quite a, lot, quite a few of us might have about data collection and surveillance through our phones, that we are up against huge systems and corporations. Even if we wanted to do something to, to resist these systems, it can feel really overwhelming that awareness of the broad concepts of data collection and surveillance can feel like the only way we can exercise control. And I'd be really interested, I think, to see how these feelings overlap or intersect with, dig with digital literacy or levels of dig digital literacy, because it might be because we're not necessarily equipped with the knowledge of how to resist these kinds of systems. And I think that Glenda living sort of rurally and living um, in communities that can often be quite isolated it might be a contributing um, might be a contributing factor. Um, the next participant, this is the second to last one, by the way. Um, and like, I could talk about these women for hours. So like, I'm going to have to, I have to like rein it in, right? So the next participant I'll talk about is Glenda, is Vesna, sorry. So Vesna is a cisgender former Bosnian refugee in her 60s. Vesna arrived in Australia in the 1990s and worked in women's health advocacy at the time of the interview. So in this photo, Vesna is standing with her brother overlooking the town where they grew up and where Vesna's brother was forced to stay during the war. When she talked about this image, Vesna said, my brother said he didn't have nice memories of this place, but then we go together with his daughter and she took that picture and, and he said, okay, I'm changing my mind about how I feel about this place now. The war and Vesna's experiences as a refugee seemed to deeply impact the ways that she felt about her smartphone and its effects on her life. Of all of the participants I interviewed, Vesna was by far the most cautious about how she used her smartphone. In her list of apps, she didn't even give me the names of some of them. She's just listed things like banking. Um, Vesna said that she reads all terms and conditions documents before she agrees to anything and has set up a secure folder on her phone to store important files. When I asked Vesna about her cautiousness, she said, the information is good to have, but also how much you want to disclose and you don't know who you who can access it. So in a way, I'm not saying that I'm resisting. I just like my information. If I have to give up, if I have to give it to the bank, I do. I don't disagree giving it to my bank if I have to. But I just think because you're all connected and it's hard to know who is looking at your information. Vesna was not resentful of corporations or governments wanting to know information about her, but she wanted to know why they needed it and what they were going to do with it. She said, I think the society is driven by profit and these corporations are trying to get as much data as possible. Even if you go shopping for clothes with those cards, they track you down and then we have a choice. So by choosing what you are going to do, you are giving them a message. So I use many things to get the benefits of the points and the balance of shopping. But on the other hand, I am more conscious. So I try to implement that in changing my habits. I think you should think about these things. Vesna had implemented a range of personal tactics in an attempt to resist corporate surveillance. She was very fortunate. I think she thought, felt, herself, felt of herself sort of quite fortunate to be literate in how to implement these practices. And I think that could be a great teacher in terms of equipping older women, particularly from migrant and refugee backgrounds, how to ensure their technological use is secure. And it's interesting that is sort of one of the initiatives that has come up recently in Australia is like um, uh, tech support for older women. So the final participant that I'll talk about today is Louisa. Louisa is a white transgender woman in her 40s who lives in rural Victoria, about an hour's drive from Melbourne. This photo from her visual diary is taken in the botanic gardens in the town where she lives. Sesna described how she liked to go running here at dawn and dusk, but when the light was fading and that running here gave her a feeling of empowerment and control. 
At the time of the interview, Louisa was about to graduate and become a doctor, having spent much of the past few years struggling to make ends meet. Louisa had this incredible capacity for self-reflexivity, which made talking to her an absolute joy. And Louisa was also unique amongst the participants in that she had two iPhones that she used interchangeably. She was not able to afford to have a smartphone that could have all the storage that she needed. So she used these two second, secondhand phones instead and kind of split her apps between the two kind of fairly randomly. Like she would sort of pick one up and be like, oh, is an app on this one? No, it's on the other one. And, you know, like but that's the kind of that's sort of the systems that we're kind of forced into. Right. Um, and like not having much money was a major contributing factor to Louise's attitudes towards her phones. She really did have many, many other things to think about. So when I asked Louisa about whether she was worried about data collection through her through her smartphone, she said, I'm very aware it's a thing, though. And it does creep me out because I know that, you know, what's happened in the 30s in places like Europe is not very far away from us. And it wasn't that long ago. And there's other places in the world that do have terrible sort of, you know, government regimes. I guess what I'm saying is we could fall into a bad situation politically and end up in perhaps a sort of fascistic society in 20 years or something awful like that. And then it really would be a problem if all your movements are known. The phone has this presence that can be tracked and so many of your your interactions can be viewed and stored and flagged. I actually don't think about this. It's just something that I know is there. And if I was more politically active, I probably would be more concerned. In this quote, Louisa indicates that her phone collecting her data is creepy because of how quickly things could change and how quickly they could sort of go downhill. So it's a bit like what Helen said, political changes like the rise of the far right across the world could be hugely devastating, especially for people who have historically been marginalized, including the trans and gender diverse communities. For the moment, though, Louisa doesn't want to get caught up in worrying excessively because that's not what's currently happening. And as she put it, I'm not sure because I can't really get in the head of people that worry about it a lot. As far as Louisa is concerned, we have other probably more pressing concerns like gender equity and climate change to be worried about. In our interview, she said, if we start acting on some of these really big concerns that we have, these big issues that face us, it's not going to be done in terms of data and things that are really important with the, with the data collection issue. Those are going to be almost irrelevancies. So while I don't completely agree with Louise's assessment of the situation here, I think big data is like deeply relevant for how contemporary life gets organized and functions. I really do appreciate what she's trying to emphasize, um, that she's trying to emphasize the significance of lived experience, quality of life and other aspects of everyday life that can be experienced non-digitally. So participant attitudes and feelings point to an opportunity, I think, for greater community awareness around smartphone data collection, surveillance and privacy. As Helen's experience tells us, we need to ensure that campaigns for digital rights don't inadvertently harm or hinder those communities who may have found most benefit from a, from a more datafied society. Glenda's attitudes and experience tell us that we may need to ensure people are equipped with the literacy and skills necessary to make informed decisions about their data. And as the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission also points out, as Vesna indicated, there is a need to balance privacy risks and concerns with the realities of everyday life. And while Louise's experience tells us that we need to think holistically about how our data-driven lives can impact our relationships and environment. So should we be concerned about rampant data collection and surveillance? I think yes. But I'm going to borrow a turn of phrase from Glenda here, which is that I don't think we should be alert and alarmed. Instead, I think there are some tactics and approach that can be reached, um, that we could be reaching for, that could be beneficial. And um, I think these things need reframing um, and amplification in an Australian context. But I'm very, so I'm very, very interested to have a discussion with you about the the UK and the EU context, which Danelza and I were talking about over lunch. And I think there are some things that we could be learning from the experience of of the UK. Um, And as like Burgess et al. state in their book, quote, beyond refusal and activism in support of greater regulation, we are left wondering what role ordinary people are meant to have in all this and what pockets of hope and strength-based resources might already exist in their lives. So a few ideas that I sort of 
keep coming back to when I'm writing and I'm thinking about this is first of all, data sovereignty. So that's a particularly important thing um, for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, activists in Australia. That's sort of something that's really that's really important. But I don't know enough about it. I don't know how enough about how that would be enacted or implemented. But I think that's something that kind of is sort of continually being kind of brought up. I think there are lots of individual tactics for resistance. I think that we've got things. Um, there are ways, like I said before, about sort of like enhancing literacy around um, data collection practices. And actually what I found in doing my interviews was that many of the people that I spoke to were like, I've never thought about this before, but now I have thought about it and I do think I want to do things differently. So I think that like literacy and just having a conversation with people could be can be a really powerful way of um, uh, sort of enhancing individual tactics. I think there needs to be much greater government accountability beyond just kind of, I don't, I really hate um, sort of this kind of blanket statement about like regulation. So it's like what regulation, to what extent, through what processes and what mechanisms, what levers can be pulled to enhance um, that regulation and enhance that accountability, but also corporate accountability as well. So how do we hold corporations to account for their uses of our data? So I think I've like, raced through all of my stuff so um I'll just say thank you so much for your time I really would love to have more of a discussion with you um so please uh ask ask questions and keep in touch I've got my email my twitter which I think is gonna apparently that's gonna just completely fall over in the next week right um yeah so we've got two questions great uh you've got one question, uh, well, two questions from Sarah. So the first question were, how many people were involved? There were 12 people involved. It was a very small ethnographic study. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity to kind of, it really expand. I would love to be able to expand that um, that number. That would be, that would be good. And um, you can see the other one is, what do you think of health tracking apps? That could be seen as some form of personal surveillance. Ah, that's such a good question because I know that there's um a researcher in Australia. There's several researchers in Australia, but the one that comes to mind is Deborah Lupton, who does lots of work on the ways that people use um uh, like health tracking, sports tracking apps, and the ways that those kinds of um personal surveillance tactics are kind of used for kind of self-regulation and actually Louisa talked about that in her in her interview she talked about how she used those she used apps to kind of monitor how much she was exercising but also how much she was um like not how much she was eating but kind of like she was used it to track like nutritional information so was she getting enough iron was she getting enough x y and z um which she sort of went through kind of peaks and troughs of using so she would use them for a while and then be like oh, I'm getting a bit obsessed with this and then so she would drop down again and I think that's kind of um uh I think that's kind of um yeah it, like it doesn't need to be a um this sort of blanket rule right where everybody do you do you use them constantly and use them all the time you can kind of come dip in and out of them and are women less inclined to use these compared to men? Great question. And I actually have never done any research with men. And it's not because I'm like ideologically opposed to it. It's just because I'm like, I just haven't. But um, that is something that I'm going to start to do when I get back uh, to Australia. Ooh, I think we're going to have a Zoom person. Um, uh, Leonie, did you have your hand up? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, I think one thing I really appreciate about this research is that it really wants, makes you reflect on like kind of our phone usage, because while you were speaking and talking about um, the different um, case studies and, and, and individuals, you know, I was thinking like how we all kind of approach our engagement with the phone, with the laptop, with anything as like kind of normal. I haven't questions ever I just assume everybody does the same, but then hearing that someone has two phones for storage purposes or that someone uses, you know, 
here I said an average person that like has not for like security reasons because of requirements from the university uh, a secure folder storage has been inclined to do this is is kind of you know it, it's exciting and like makes me hopeful about society um and I was wondering you know um I have kind of two questions like perhaps three so uh and they're more like kind of uh questions to, to for reflection so number one is um you know have you thought about like the general insights like I mean you have the slides of like kind of the things about like that data sovereignty but like if you had to pin it down to three things like what were the most surprising things that you have gone into this research we're not anticipating finding that's number one yeah. um and I the, perhaps the second one uh, is I'm, I'm just wondering like have you thought about because what you did was make people reflect about their phone usage um yeah. and while you took a snapshot um actually could you envision that you by asking them make them change things and um have you heard any changes in patterns and behavior because it's i think you know we forget that research especially with people when you ask them things makes them reconsider things and like then you, your research had an effect mm -hmm. that that's the two Okay. Okay. So the first one, the three, the three most surprising things. Um, I might just stop sharing my screen so that my laptop doesn't sound like it's going to uh, take off. Take off. Um, so the three most surprising, I think the first, the thing that like absolutely blew my mind was exactly like you said, that I thought that people would be thinking about the ways that their phone was monitoring them like I just thought that was normal I thought that it was normal to be concerned about this stuff all the time um and then I was I was absolutely I was shocked that there was um there were several people who said I would prefer not to think about it like um I included one example Glenda here because that was sort of one of the case studies but there were a few other people that were like I would just prefer not to think about this stuff I've chosen the act I've chosen ignorance basically I've chosen to be um aware and unconcerned um which I found quite I really I really I found quite shocking um the other things that I think really surprised me were um I think yeah this I think the thing about like nobody nobody really bringing up like people brought up gendered violence in a kind of a like a yeah it was like in a sort of uh like quite an offhand way like I'm thinking of one example of somebody who talked about um you know using um always having like location turned on on their phone when they went for a run because they were like oh if something happens to me if someone attacks me while I'm out for a run they can find me using my phone and I was like what <laughs> that's like that's kind of you know that like you know really off this really sort of offhand I read this in a book and I thought that would be interesting kind of way that was I found that quite um quite a shock this sort of acceptance of the threat of gendered violence in some ways um but not being really worried about it just more like there eh, you know and the thing is at the, at the same time I'm also very conscious of the fact that like most gendered violence occurs in the home by people who are known to each other like that's you know that's that's just the way that um things are but like my own experience like I was saying before I'm like an avid runner I run a lot and um it's something that kind of you know I think about from time to time and I think about sort of fairly frequently so that was something that I found really interesting and sort of surprising as well um but I think the thing that sort of like was a pleasant surprise was how much people were willing to um I think reflect on their own practices and it, that sort of feeds into the second question which is that I've definitely heard at the end of almost every interview people said I'm I'm you know I'm this has really changed my thinking about my phone and um 
and there's a woman that I see fairly frequently um, who's like she's sort of a friend that was took part in the research and she every time she sees me she tells me about how you know that interview really helped her kind of rethink um yeah re, yeah rethink the way that she used her phone and I can see there's another question from Sarah could you maybe give a three-point summary of the novel insights you gained in the context of existing privacy concerns research oh my goodness Sarah that is a that is a question um uh I don't know actually I'm not prepared for, I'm actually not I don't think I'm that prepared to answer um in such in kind of that much detail about because I'm not a privacy expert right like I'm a digital ethnographer feminist media practices researcher like I um I'm not super duper au fait with like privacy research in general but like I would be very interested in sort of what um like what yeah what what kind of it prompted that question I suppose um if you wouldn't mind elaborating a little bit while I plug in my computer so it doesn't die um but yeah just finding yeah just finding a little bit more about kind of that question would be really handy <laughs> I don't know if Sarah is willing to unmute, but I suspect um, for context for Caitlin, uh, a lot of the people that are in, in today's um, uh, chat today um, are coming from the CDT in cybersecurity, uh, many of which approach the research like uh, from a very technical cybersecurity perspective um, and uh, or coming from an uh, also human computer interaction research perspective where you look at like privacy practices. Um, so um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's something that I, that is something that I do think is really important. And I do think that like, that's kind of, you know, this was just like a PhD, this PhD was just kind of one part of a much broader set of concerns. And I think that like, uh, examining the existing privacy um, research is something that's that would be really kind of that would be like, for me, the next step, and then would supplement with more data to kind of bolster it, I suppose. But I th think the thing that springs to mind actually straight away is the um there is currently a review of the privacy act underway in australia so one of the kind of recommendations from that digital platforms inquiry is a review of the of the um a review of the privacy act because it's kind of not fit for purpose in the way in the sort of the uh, for digital environments and for digital um data collection practices um but like the thing that I said in my thesis, so the person who they're no longer the attorney general, um, but uh, yeah, the former attorney general, the person who was leading this review initially um, ha was eventually forced to resign from the front bench because um um he was forced to resign from the from the front bench because he had an unresolved accusation of sexual assault right so he's the person who's leading he was leading the privacy review and you know it, it, it like this is the context in which i think a lot of this stuff is taking place it's happening you we're, we're existing in a society where like it's extremely it's extremely misogynistic it's extremely sexist and um yeah that's kind of the context in which kind of all of this is taking place which I think then feeds into how people mistrust governments to handle their data like the number like plenty of people um there were a few people rather that I spoke to who said that they would they trusted corporations more than governments to handle their data like they didn't trust the Australian government because they it yeah they just didn't trust it so Sarah's asked, it'd be great if you could just think out loud about what you found surprising from what your interviewees said. Does it, for instance, align with the privacy paradox literature? Privacy, pa I'm not familiar with the privacy paradox literature. Um, I, I think, again, like, I think uh, 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 this is a, a clash in, in perhaps disciplinary, like, boundaries. And, and I do think, uh, uh, aligning with Sarah, there may be much to learn and to interpret the findings in the kind of human-computer interaction kind mm -hmm. of community. Um, so, I mean, I, I the privacy paradox is kind of the idea that, like, there's a discrepancy, people knowing, um, uh, you know, 
that there's privacy concerns and like then not but, but still not acting upon that um and and i do think like your research would profit like from this like angle of looking at like the existing research in kind of if you look at CHI, um, which is a big conference where a lot of work is being done on smartphone pattern usage, I do acknowledge and accept, um, Caitlin, your background is more in kind of digital ethnography, which is might be a bit like removed from the um, uh, audience today. Uh, uh, um, uh, but um, yeah, perhaps it's more, uh, so I so I don't know if you can respond to Sarah, considering that you're not familiar with that literature, but for to 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 indirectly respond to Sarah, just to say that like like digital ethnography group uh, of researchers is, is is different. Like uh, Caitlin doesn't come from kind of the HCI or yeah privacy no. kind of yeah. No, and I think that that is a that is a massive limitation of the research that I've done. Like I don't think. Um, I'm saying anything new or revelatory and I think that there's plenty of I would be like yeah more than happy to learn more from the HCI field and school of thought I think that's a really it's a really good suggestion thank you I'm going to jump in okay I have a question um on the more social side um because that's where my human computer interaction side being on my research and I'm particularly interested in with all of this really fantastic research will you be returning to anybody that you've interviewed or will you be maybe exploring the changes that legislation has made on us considering our our data for instance on um, the abortion legislation changes in america mm. i know that that was felt in the uk mm -hmm. and i know from friends in australia a lot of women started uninstalling their period tracking apps and so COVID as well with, for instance, in the UK, the NHS track and trace, a lot of data privacy conversations started happening, particularly in COVID as well. So are you maybe returning to the individuals that you spoke to or will you maybe be exploring going forward the larger awareness as well that we've really been confronted with on where our data is going and if it's actually going to be used to criminally charge us as well, even if we are in a situation which might conflict with legislation that's put in place? That's a really good question. I would, I'm in two minds about returning to the people that I that I spoke to. I think it's definitely a possibility, um, but I haven't quite sort of settled on what's next, I suppose. Um, and sort of waiting for like examiner's reports, I think, to kind of decide on that stuff really um and uh yeah they um yeah those period tracking apps are a nightmare um mm -hmm. and the one of the things that I've just so like in the last I don't know 24 hours there's been a report from Australia that the that the the data that was that was collected using the so each basically for context so in Australia, we have all these different states and they all kind of have their own different sort of regulations. They all have a an information commissioner. They all have a privacy commissioner. And then there's a federal system as well. Um, and in Australia, we had, so each state also had their own trace, their contact tracing app that we used during the pandemic or during the kind of the height of the pandemic. And in the last 24 hours, it's been revealed that that data has been sold despite being kind of, like some of that data has been sold to third parties, despite the kind of, you know, the the sort of the I think the the assumption that it just wouldn't be, or that you know that it that wasn't going to be um that wasn't that was part of the reason why it managed to get such massive uptake from these from um citizens to use it, which I think was you know is really important, um, uh, and. Yeah, it's just like it's really disappointing. It's just really disappointing to see that, like, despite the fact that you know there's all this kind of, um, uh, yeah, there's all this sort of research that says that you know people don't trust these apps or they're sort of wary of using them, and there's all these sort of social and political implications of them, um, of the, that data being shared, or there's risks for people that still that is still happening just as a matter of course um I'm not sure if that answered your question yeah no that's it, it's really fascinating as yeah well, that the potential to experience a criminal 
process mm. from the data that is collected from mobile phone usage. Mm. Really Absolutely, yeah. And I think that there's like, there's way more other, I think this is what I was trying to get at when we were talking before, that like, I don't think that my re- my PhD research has, you know, it, like I said, much new. I don't think this is like sort of brand new information. But I also think that there's a lot of, there's much more work that could be done between sort of the like digital ethnographers and human computer interaction research. Like there's way more opportunity for collaboration um, to kind of go a bit deeper on some of these questions from both from both perspectives, right? So like sort of we can do some of the kind of social social stuff and like HCI researchers can actually kind of offer, um, I think perhaps some more uh, like tech, like technical expertise and understanding some of these systems. So I think there's really, I think we really have to be working together rather than like across purposes necessarily. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, um, I'm considerate of the time and uh, people's commitments in the case they have another meeting at five. Um, uh, so um, I think uh, we, we, we stop here at this stage and, and, um, Really, thank you so much, Caitlin, for uh, presenting this work um, today. I think there's uh, uh, lots of questions around like disciplinary boundaries and where one sits and like looking into um, different areas of research to, to um, see what developments are happening in other spaces. So thanks so much for, for opening that like uh, insight today. Um, and uh, to everyone uh, attending, thank you so much uh, for, for joining. I actually think there's another question that came from Kyle, but um, I do know Kyle, uh, I don't know if Kyle is actually in the room uh, or not. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm actually, yes. I'm, yeah, Perfect. I'm just here. <laughs> Perfect. So, so in that case, perhaps Kyle, I, 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 I ask uh, if the two of you perhaps like uh, over a cup of tea or so uh, uh, resolve this after this, okay. because I, I want to end on time and allow people to uh, uh, give uh, Caitlin a round of applause and say thank you to everyone. Um, uh, so uh, again, uh, I know the digital versions is not as good as the real one. I hope you get some in the room. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for, for coming and uh, sharing your work and thanks everyone for joining. And uh, uh, I hope uh, there will be more interesting conversations in the future. And um, yeah, thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Leonie. Thank you. Take care.